to something that I briefly mentioned last week and didn't get a whole lot of response to it, so it made me nervous. I don't know if you understood what I was saying or you just weren't sure how to answer the question, but John chapter 7, verse 47 through 49. John 7, 47 through 49. This is a salvation type message, so we'll see where that goes. But John 7, verse 47. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth the, not the law are cursed. They said, but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. And the question is, is that accurate? Is that a true statement that those who do not know the law are cursed? I dare say that it is going to be just the opposite of what they proffer there. That it is those who do know the law that are cursed and not those that do not know the law. So this morning I'm going to preach to you a sermon in just a second called The Curse of the Law. These Pharisees ask a question. They say, are ye also deceived? And they say, they say you're deceived if you believe that to be without the law is to be cursed. That's the deception that they believe. They believe that if you think that having the law is a curse, you're deceived. But I dare say that if the law is what you are under for salvation, it is a curse to you. Now, to those of us who have been born again, who have been saved, we recognize the law is good and holy and just and pure and perfect, converting even the soul. We recognize as Bible believers that the whole counsel of God ought to be preached and believe that all the law of God is good for the Christian. But it is not the way, the means by which you are saved. You don't get saved by keeping the law. You don't get saved by reading the Bible. You don't get saved by being a good person or having a, a good life. That's not how you're born again. That's not how you're saved. And yet the Pharisees say that if an individual believes there's any salvation outside of the law, they are deceived. But I dare say if you say there's any salvation outside of the gospel, you, sir, ma'am, are deceived. Yes. And if you are trusting in the law for your salvation, you are not only deceived, but you are under a curse. Because salvation comes by the very question they ask in verse 48. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Let me just say that if you are trusting in the law and keeping the law for salvation, you are deceived. Amen. Salvation comes by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. The Philippian jailer asked the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the reply was not keep the law. The reply was not read your Bible. The reply was not go to church. The, by, the, the reply was not turn over a good leaf. Amen. The reply was not be a good person. The reply was not give money to your favorite local charity or organization. The reply was not help old ladies across the street. The reply was not have social change. The reply was not uh, uh, go and be a good person. No, the reply was simply this. Believe Amen. on the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. and thou shalt be saved. Amen. In fact, the very nature of where the question was asked in prison is a picture of where people who are trying to keep the law find themselves. In bondage and imprisoned to a, to a, 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 a law or a religion that says you can get to heaven by being a good person. Or at least you can hope that you'll go to heaven by being a good person. Well, I can tell you that you can hope all day long, yeah. but if you have not believed on the one who died for you, if you have not received the trust of the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you, you, sir, you, ma'am, are in bondage uh, to a religion that will damn your soul to hell, curse in everlasting fire and torment, and you will not go to heaven when you die. Amen. Amen. The only way to heaven is to do the complete opposite of what these Pharisees are saying. Yeah. They say, keep the law. May I suggest I, to you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible says that we are cursed if we are under the law. So for a little while, I want to preach on the curse of the law. Go to Galatians chapter 3, where I want to preach out of. I was going to preach a sermon that was six points and three pages long. <laughs> Now, that's what I plan on preaching next week, so you don't want to come next week. <laughs> yeah. I'm already telling you, it's, it's six points and three pages. 
So I said, all right, Lord, if that's too long, give me something short. So he gave me a one-page sermon. Okay. But it's got seven points. Right. And if you've got a bulletin, you've got all seven points. Yep. So if I don't get to them all, you at least have the points. Okay. But I would like to try to preach all seven. Seven's the number of perfection or completion. So I'd like to get through all seven before dinner tonight. Galatians chapter 3, the Celtics are playing at 1 o'clock against the Miami Heat. And God forbid I should miss that game and not be in church. Amen. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a what? For as many as are under the works of the law, Pharisee, you are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in the things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us. That's the one you got to believe on. Amen. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, Amen. being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Amen. You ever wonder why Jesus Christ was crucified on a tree and now stoned with rocks or drowned in the river or dragged behind a, a, a bed of mules? You ever wonder why that is? Because the law had within it written a statement that said, if you hang on a tree, you're cursed. And so Jesus Christ, in order to bear the full weight of the law, he had to die on the old rugged cross. Amen. That's why Paul says the preaching of the cross is to them which perish foolishness. Yeah. But Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the cross. So we preach the cross because it is a cursed tree. Yeah. It is a cursed tree under the law. So the first point I want to give to you this morning is, first of all, the condition of the law. The condition of the law. What is the condition of the law? It is works. Yeah. Works is the condition of the law. The law was given so that the Old Testament individual who had the law could work his way to righteousness. Right. Now, he could never be 100% righteous, but he could have personal righteousness so long as he kept the law, did the things that were contained under the law, and offered sacrifices and offerings that were prescribed under the law to have a temporary reprieve from judgment. The Old Testament is a works-based religious system that was instituted by God to govern the nation of Israel. So that as they journeyed or as they journeyed and wandered and got to the promised land, they would have something to live by. It was going to be the law. And God gave the law. That's why a Pharisee is one who keeps the law, or at least professes to keep the law, although none of them ever did. No Pharisee ever keeps the law. He just expects you to keep the law. Like a politician. What is a Pharisee? A Pharisee is one who tells you all that you're doing wrong while being a hypocrite, he himself not doing what he professes that he does. Now the law, the condition of the law that is works would only be a temporary means of dealing with mankind. Why? Because the weakness of man could not sustain the weight and strength of the law. No individual can bear up against the law. The, the weight and the heaviness, the stone that is the law, the weight, the millstone, if you will, that is the law, is too heavy to wear around your neck. Yeah. So why did God give that to them? To make them realize that no man can live up to the standard of the law. It was to bring a man to his knees, as it were. So an individual who's trying to live according to the law, they are living a losing battle. They are living a battle that will destroy them, that will crush them, and will bring them down into what's called the lower parts of the earth. Yeah. The heart of the earth, that is where hell is located. That is where the millstone, the law, will bring you to. You cannot walk. 
You cannot bear up against the weight and the strength of the law. Because the condition of law of the law is works, and you don't have the works that it takes to get to heaven. Right. I don't care how good you are. The works prescribed within the law tell you you are the total opposite of what you think you are. Yeah. Even on your best of days, and you'll have them, you are not as good as the law demands you to be to get to heaven. Number two, the continuation of the law. Look at verse 11. See, the, the condition of the law, he says, for as many as are of the works of the law, that's the condition, are under a curse. For it is cur as written, cursed is everyone, nobody's excluded, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things. The continuation of the law is, doesn't work like this. That on today's best day, I achieve the law. What about tomorrow? What about the next day? What about the day after that? Hey, what about 70 years, the Bible says. The Bible says a man has about 70 years to live. And if by matter of strength, you might get to 80. And if you take your vitamins and do your exercises and avoid the, the things they tell you to avoid and eat the things they tell you to eat, you might actually make it to 90, 100 years old. Could you imagine living... Every day under the law, you couldn't sustain it. The weight of the law demands, not that you keep it just for one day, but what? That you continue, watch it, in all things that are written in the law. Do you know that all things, if you are an individual who believes you can get to heaven by being a good person, by keeping the golden rule of the Ten Commandments, do you know there's more than just the Ten Commandments in the Bible that make up the law? Amen. Do you know that if you are not in Christ and you are under the bondage of the law, that even the very clothes you are wearing today would break the demands of the Amen. law? Yeah. The very foods you buy at the grocery stores would demand that you are a breaker of the law. Yep. Because the law has contained with it things concerning dietary <laughs> needs, things concerning your clothing, uh, things concerning your hair, men and ladies. Uh, men, if you don't have a beard this morning, guess what? You have broken the law. See, I can't grow a beard, then guess what? You broke the law. Because God made it to where a Jew could grow his hair. The law said that a man had to keep his beard such a certain length and couldn't shave the corners thereof. And when it was shaved off, it was a shame to them. Yeah. That's the demand of the law, Christian. You say, but well, that's for a Jew. Yeah, hello, who do you think the law was made for? The law was made for the nation of Israel. Are any of you here from the nation of Israel in the Old Testament? No. But you don't even know that if you're not in Christ. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Hey, if you're in Christ, you recognize this morning, I don't belong to the nation of Israel. I don't even belong to the Gentile. I belong to Christ. Yeah, that's right. But if you don't belong to Christ, you got to belong to somebody. Yeah. Who do you belong to? Well, I'm a Gentile. Yeah, but the law of God was written in your heart. Yeah. Yeah. Do you keep the law every single day? Hey, let me ask you a question, Gentile. Not under the law of the nation of Israel. You ever told a lie? You ever told a lie? Well, it's a little white lie. No, the Bible don't discern between light and white lie and little lie. Yeah. He just says all liars. Yes. But I told that lie last week. Okay, well, wait till you tell the next lie. Hey, if you're under the works of the law, even written in your heart, of thou shalt not bear false witness, you have to continue every single day for the rest of your life never to bear false witness, never to covet, never to tell a lie, never to worship something that is not God. Are you with me, Christian? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or lost person under the curse of the law? The continuation of the law demands that you do all things contained therein. The Old and New Testament together have 618 laws. Amen. How are we doing this morning? Mm -hmm. And if you feel worthy to get to heaven and tell God I kept all... You see, I don't even know what all 618 That's right. are. That's your problem, not his. Yeah. Yeah. God demands you keep the law. Mm -hmm. And ignorance is no excuse to get into heaven. Alright, so what does it say? It says continuing in all the laws. There were conditions in the Old Testament of forgiveness through sacrifices for breaking the law. 
But there are also laws that if broken could not be forgiven through sacrifice. You know the law of murder and adultery could not be forgiven under the Old Testament law. There was no sacrifice that you could give for adultery or murder. And the Bible says if I look at somebody cross-eyed with bitterness and hatred in my heart, I'm as bad as a murderer. So I never killed anybody. You ever killed somebody with your heart? You ever kill somebody with your thoughts? You ever kill somebody with your tongue? You ever kill somebody with your fingers? You ever killed their reputation? You ever killed a relationship? You ever killed a friendship? The Bible says, uh, hey, man, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart and you're married, guess what? You've committed adultery all with her already. Guess what? You broke the law. Without ever lying in the bed with her, you broke the law here because you played the thing out in your mind. And there is no sacrifice under the law to be able to forgive an individual. Why do you think David, when he committed two sins of murder and adultery, he said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me? Why do you think David was very concerned about his eternal soul? Because he knew there was no law that he could be, uh, no uh, uh, sacrifice that could be made that would forgive him under those circumstances. In the New Testament, guess what, Christian? All of our sins are forgiven. Amen. All sins. Past sins, present Amen. sins, and the sins you ain't even committed yet Amen. are all forgiven in Christ. The law could not do that. All of our sins are forgiven through one sacrifice. You only need to break one law and be forgiven by one sacrifice to take care of all sins forever Amen. without any more sacrifice required. Amen. You say, where is that in the Bible? Well, how about this? Or hey, where was that sacrifice? It was on the Calvary's tree. Yes, it was. Amen. It was on Calvary. Well, who made the sacrifice? Christ. Yes. Well, what was the sacrifice? Christ. Yes. He was both the high priest and he was the lamb yes. to make the sacrifice. Amen. He fulfilled both the office and he fulfilled the, uh, the atonement uh, required for forgiveness of sins. Amen. Say, where is that? Hebrews 10 verse 12. But this man, Christ Jesus, but this man, uh, let me get there. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, Amen. sat down on the right hand of God. Yeah. Amen. Listen, he came down one time, lived 30 plus years as a sinless, perfect, spotless man, lamb, Offering. Amen. At the end of his life, he allowed himself, he laid down his life on a tree to be made a sacrifice for the sin of the whole world Amen. in one moment of time. Amen. One man, one sacrifice, one offering, one uh, cross, one time forever. Amen. Amen. To do what? To pay for all sins forever. That's right. Amen. Amen. And yet, to try to think you're going to get to heaven any other way is to live under the curse of the law. Amen. Not because the curse has not been offered to be removed, but because you refuse to take the medicine That's right. That's right. prescribed to you, which is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Number three, the confirmation of the law. We'll see that in verse 17, the confirmation of the law. Now, I'm kind of making this fit my agenda here, so... Forgive me for a second, because I needed a C-O-N word. <laughs> and this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul. That it should make the promise of none effect. What am I saying? The, the, the thing that was confirmed here was a covenant that God made with Abraham while he was asleep. God made a covenant with Abraham while he was asleep that... Abraham would get the land of the nation of Israel forever and would not only be to him, but to his seed after him forever. That was a covenant that God made with Abraham and he confirmed that covenant while he was asleep. And the law came 430 years after that covenant was made with Abraham. And he says the law could not disannul the covenant that God made with Abraham. So the thing that was confirmed with Abraham, the law could not disannul that. But let me just say this. While the law could not disannul the Abrahamic covenant, I will say this, that if the law does confirm, that if you don't keep the law, you're going to hell. Right. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. The law cannot undo a promise made. So let me give it to you like this. If you are born again this morning, if God has made the promise of everlasting eternal life with you, then God is faithful to keep that promise. Amen. And no law that still is in existence or a law that would come down the road could, could disannul a promise that God has made to you. Amen. If God has said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, you're saved if you believe on Him. If the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you call upon the name of the Lord, then guess what? He cannot disannul the promise of salvation that He's made to you, even if you were to break the law down the road. Amen. He cannot remove a promise made to you because He's made it with you in His Word. Nevertheless, the law does confirm that if you don't keep the law, you're going to hell. In Exodus 19.8, here's what the nation of Israel said. So here's the thing. You say, well, how did the law come into effect? Here's how it came into effect. You ready? This isn't fair for you and I, but this is how it worked. The Lord shows up on Mount Sinai there. You've seen Charlton Heston, right? Yeah. Yeah. Moses, right? The Ten Commandments and all that kind of stuff. So there's Mount Sinai on fire. And there's the clouds and there's a voice and a thunder. And all the people at the base of the mountain did what? They became afraid of that. Right? Because there's the lightning and a thunder and clouds and a booming voice that is coming out of heaven. They were afraid of that, so they didn't want to be close to the mountain. So they were like, hey, Moses, Exodus 19, 8, hear what they said. All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. do. Amen. They made a covenant with God to keep the law before he even gave it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yes, they did. Because they didn't want to be around the mountain to hear it. Yeah. They were too afraid. So Moses tells the Lord that, and the Lord's like, okay, here we go. Yeah. And so God then institutes the law because they predetermined whatever he says, we'll do it. And that gave God what? A blank check. Yeah. <laughs> All. Now, if he's God... I think he could have done a little bit more than 618 laws, don't sure. you? Yeah. I think God would have held a few. Yeah. Say, God's mean. No, God could have made it a whole lot worse. Yeah. yeah. Here's the truth. You ready? They confirmed the law before the law was even there. Yeah. Because they were afraid of God and they knew that they could not live up against the weight of God. So whatever he says, we'll just do it. Yeah. Amen. Now, here's the truth. God has given us his word and he has confirmed that the only way you're going to get saved is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Your response to that ought to be this. All you say, Lord, to me, I'll do it. Amen. Lord, if you say the way I go to heaven is to believe on your son, the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ, and not keep the law, well, uh, if Israel couldn't do it, I certainly can't do it. So I'm going to do the only thing I know how to do, and that is to believe yes. that Jesus Christ died Amen. on the old rugged cross. Amen. Because that doesn't demand... A lifetime right. of anything. Yes. It demands a one-time personal agreement with God. Yes. Like they made at the mountain. They said, oh, you command of us, we'll do it. And a covenant was made and God brought the law in. Don't you know that if you were to come to God in fear of going to hell, and if you said, Lord Jesus, if you demand that I believe on you for salvation, and I have no other choice, that that's the law of salvation, that I will believe on you, and I am receiving you as my Savior by faith. You know what God would do? He'd make a covenant with you right there. Amen. That he cannot break. He cannot go back on. Amen. To not do that is to live under the curse of the Old Testament. And that's a millstone around your neck. When Israel said this, they confirmed and publicly committed to what the law said. Even though the Lord knew they would not be able to fulfill their obligations. You know the Bible says this? If you get saved, the Bible says this, you have to make it public. You know that? Yeah, amen. Confession is made known unto salvation. I believe there's two parts to salvation. There's the belief here unto righteousness, but confession is made known unto salvation. Belief comes in the heart of what I'm saying is true. The salvation element of that is when you call upon the Lord and call upon Him for salvation, but take it a step further. Now that you're saved, you have to have a public testimony of your salvation. Amen. It ought to become a public thing. 
God didn't expect the nation of Israel to believe all the things that he was going to tell them in their heart. They had enough sense more than most to at the foot of, uh, of Sinai there to say it with their mouth. Amen. And yet, so many just say, well, if you just believe in your heart, you can go to heaven. If you just believe it here, you're good. Well, hey, listen, how can the Bible says, whosoever shall call, yeah, amen. where does that come from? Hey, if you believe it here, you should have no problem calling upon Christ. Right. Hey, if you have the belief on the righteousness here, if you believe that Christ is the only way to get to heaven, you should have no problem saying, Christ, I believe you're the only way to get to heaven. Amen. And I'm receiving you as my Savior. Salvation right there. Mm -hmm. With the heart, man believe in the righteousness. With the mouth, confess made on the salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Amen. shall be saved. You can't get around it. Amen. Any more you can get around Mount Sinai. Now the connection of the law. Verse 24. The connection of the law. Look at verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified. How? By right? Because look, if you go back and look at verse number 11, no man is justified how? By the law. Verse 11, no man is justified by the law. Verse 24, so the Bible says we are justified how? By faith. What is justified? Just as if I'd never sinned. <coughs> hey, when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, He washes away all sins, Amen. past, present, and future. And when He sees you, He don't see the sins you committed. Amen. It's all washed away in the blood of Christ. He sees the Savior. Amen. He sees you as redeemed. He sees you as spotless. He sees you as He sees Himself. Amen. See, I don't see myself that way. That's because you're looking on the outside. Yeah, yeah. Right. Man, that's on the outward appearance. Where does God look? Yeah. He looks on the inward Amen. appearance. God knows if you're saved or not. Now, you may not know if you're saved or not, but God knows it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you might want to know if you're saved or not. Yeah. <laughs> you might want to confirm it that you're saved. Amen. Amen. The connection to the law is this. He is what? He's called a schoolmaster. Yeah. If you've been in any kind of school at all, a schoolmaster is the person who walks around with a ruler, racking your knuckles is what they used to be. Right. Or there was a dunce cap in the corner. I don't know what they do today. I haven't been in school forever. They probably just, you know, let you run wild or yeah. anything. Yeah, there is no schoolmaster. They give you all trophies for being disobedient. <laughs> but, but the goal, the goal of the law was to bring you to Christ. Right. That's the goal of the law. What is your educator's goal to be? To bring you to the knowledge of something. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. You're in school to learn something. Right. So Christ came to bring you to the knowledge of Him. Right. That's why He came. Hold your finger in Galatians. Romans. Look at Romans real quick. Unless you can save it any time during this message. Don't wait for me to finish it. Amen. But I want to try to finish it. In case you're not sure. Mm -hmm. Romans 9. Now, I'm not charismatic, but if somebody just got a little nutty on salvation, it'd be okay. <laughs> Romans chapter 9, verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. See, there's the law of righteousness because the righteous demands that you be righteous, but they could not attain up to that level. Right. See that? Yeah. Why? Wherefore? How come? What's the purpose? What's the plan? What's going on here? Because they sought it not by faith. The law does not demand faith. Yeah. Because we live by faith and not by sight. The law is a thing of sight. Faith is a thing of no sight. Right. Yeah. Believing in a Savior you've never seen. Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whosoever, now here's that, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And whosoever believeth on him, Jesus, what? Shall not be ashamed. Amen. If you're saved but you can't tell anybody you're saved, I'm going to say, you got a problem. Right, amen. You got a problem. All right, now listen. The law was given to prove you cannot attain the law. Israel, in their attempt to keep the law, when Christ showed up, they stumbled at his words. The Pharisees said, hey, has anybody believed on him? Because those that are without the law are cursed. And if you believe on that man and say the law is of no good, you're cursed. What are they doing? They're stumbling at Christ. Yeah. 
He's the stumbling stone. But so is the Ten Commandments. A stumbling stone. Why? Because they were written on tables of stone. And nobody could keep the law, right? Yeah. So they're constantly stumbling over and tripping over. So God sent his own law into the world. A rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. In who? In the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is he? He's the lawgiver. He gives the law. He keeps the law. He's never broken the law. Amen. So what do I got to do? I got to get inside of that rock. Yes. Yeah. I got to get inside that stone. And when I don't, I'm tripping and stumbling all over myself. Right. Trying to earn my way to heaven. And listen, if you're saved, you don't get saved and then try to go back and do's and don'ts to stay saved. Right. Or do's and don'ts to prove your salvation. Or to... Prove the fruit of your existence. No. The way you have a Christian walk in life is to stay hidden in the rock. Amen. That's fellowship. Yep. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, both of the law and of grace. Amen. Amen. He's the chief cornerstone of both the law and the grace. The Bible says the law came in by Moses. Right. That's right. But grace and truth came by Jesus. Jesus Christ. Amen. What's the conclusion of the law? Look at Galatians chapter 3 again, verse 22. Galatians 3, 22. The conclusion of the law. But the scripture hath concluded. What's that say? All under sin. Hey, listen. If we are all under sin, then guess what we are all under? A curse. Yeah. Right. If we are all under a sin, then we are all under a curse. And Romans 3, 23 says... For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. Now, just because you get saved don't mean you're going to live a sinless, perfect life in the flesh. You're not, but you're saved and going to heaven. Amen. Now i got to say, when I sin and I don't do what Christ wants me to do, the, the, the trick for the Christian is to know he's not going to hell over it, but he has to recognize my fellowship is hindered by it. Right. Right. And, and realizing that, when I sin as a Christian, now what's at stake is my relationship or my fellowship with Him. So I want to maintain close communion with Him. Right. The conclusion of the law is that all have sinned. What's the condemnation of the law? Point number six. That lets you know how close I am. The condemnation of the law. Verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. See where you were? Before, before faith came, which is Christ, before faith came, you're kept under the law. What's the condemnation of the law? You're in prison. You're in prison. The condemnation of the law says you're under bondage. Right. You're in bondage. Hey, look at Galatians chapter 5. And I'll try to get verse uh, point number 7 included here with verse uh, point 6. Look at Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the what? Liberty. The liberty wherewith Christ hath made us what? Free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of what? Bond. Hey, listen, the law says I'm under a curse. The law says I am under sin. The law says I am under bondage. I am, a, I am kept in prison to the law so long as I try to keep the law for salvation. Right. But faith came. Christ brought Amen. in faith as the means of salvation to do what? To set me free from prison. Amen. That's why Paul in prison there says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It was a sort of counter picture of in prison is law. Right. Oh, yeah. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ gets you out of prison, Amen. spiritually speaking. Amen. Hey, do you know that to be shut up is to have a prison death sentence? What do I mean? The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. So if all have sinned, then all are going to die. And on a very real and personal and spiritual level, we are all dead spiritually in our relationship to God according to Ephesians 2.1. The Bible says we were dead in trespasses and sins. It's not that your free will was dead. Your free will is kept alive so that you can choose to receive Christ. What was dead there was your relationship to Christ that was lost when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and God kicked them out of the garden. Man lost 
His relationship right, right, yeah. with God. Yep. Why did Christ come to earth? To restore a relationship. Yes. You know what the whole thing, it, it can be summed up. Why did Christ came? For a relationship. Amen. Yeah. You know why husbands and wives marry? For a relationship. Amen. You know why people have friends, best friends? For a relationship. God desires a close, personal relationship with his creation. Amen. Right. That's what he desires. Amen. But sin breaks the relationship with God. Right. Jesus Christ restores Amen. the relationship Amen. with God. And that's what sin does. It destroys the relationship. So what does that mean? Well, the Bible says in Revelation 21.8 that all liars are cast in the lake of fire. Revelation 21.8, all liars are cast into the lake of fire which is the second yeah. death. The moment you realize you've broken God's laws, you died spiritually. Right. Paul says in Revelation, I was alive mm -hmm. once, but then sin came yeah. and I died. Amen. The moment you realize that you're not good enough to keep the law to go to heaven, you died on the inside as your relationship to God's concerned. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ came to restore Amen. that dead and broken relationship. Amen. But if you don't get that relationship restored and repaired, yeah. you will die spiritually a second time for eternity. Yeah. There, is no, there is no coming back from that second death. The first death you can recover from. Yeah. That's why he says you must be born again. Yeah. God wants to reinstitute the relationship he had with Adam and Eve in the garden. That comes by a new birth relationship. If you will become born again by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and calling upon him by faith, the relationship is restored and you are alive. Yes, but if you don't make that decision and make the call upon God, you will die a second time spiritually speaking, and live or die eternally in a lake of fire. And can I say this for the Christian? Now that you are saved, now that you are alive, Paul says for me to live is Christ. Amen. Now that you're saved, your whole purpose for living is what? It's for Christ. Everything that's done for Christ will last. This life will soon be passed. All that's done for Christ will last. Hey, if you've been born again, you have a life worth living. And our responsibility is to live for Christ. Can I close with this? Number seven, the crucifixion of the law. The crucifixion of the law. Verse 13 in Galatians 3 said, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Notice, Christ became a curse for us. And I'm going to boil that down. Christ became a curse for me. Yes, amen. Christ became a curse amen. for you. The saying goes, if I was the only one alive, yeah. he still would have made a curse right. for me. Amen. Right. So my responsibility is to repay him yeah. the only way I can by putting my faith and trust in him amen. and receiving him as my Savior. Amen. The crucifixion for the law. The law demanded that an individual who hung on a tree be cursed. So Jesus Christ hung on that tree and was made a curse for me. Can I say this? We started with the curse of the law. The crucifixion becomes the cure. Yo, amen. It becomes the cure for the law. Circle. The crucifixion brings the cure. Say, what's, what's the cure? What's the ointment? It's the blood of Christ. Amen. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Right. That Bible says, uh, neither is there salvation in any other. The Bible says, um, uh, in whom we have forgiveness, even the remission of sins, without the, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. It says, who, who loved us and washed our, us, washed our sins in his own blood. Amen. He's called the balm of Gilead. He is the ointment yes. <laughs> that is required to, to cure what ails us, which is a sin problem, a curse. The remedy for sin is the blood of Christ. Grace brings redemption, and faith brings justification. That's, that's uh, Galatians 5, 1 and Romans 5, 1. Grace brings redemption, and faith brings justification. What is grace? 
God's riches at Christ's expense. Mm -hmm. It is unmerited favor. You don't, you don't deserve to have Christ be made a curse for you. That's right. Amen. We sure don't. We don't deserve that. Nope. He didn't deserve that. No, he didn't. Right. Well, he didn't. What we deserve is what he went through. Yeah. But he went through that, so I didn't have to go through that. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's grace. That's what brings the redeeming of the soul to him. But when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that brings justification. Amen. That wipes the slate clean. Amen. So you're worthy to go to heaven cured Amen. without a curse. Thank you, Jesus. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. If there's anybody here this morning that needs to even say, let today be the day of your salvation, Dad.